Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to the second day of our talks. Really happy you made it all on time. Did you guys have a good time yesterday at the culinary festival and the Yomos concert? It was amazing, right? I'm glad, glad to hear that. Well, today we're continuing with the talks and I would like to share something with you which is really important to me and something that I feel passionate about. And that is the way that polyglots learn languages as opposed to the way that languages are often learned in the traditional way. That means in schools and language schools, because I think there is a great, great difference. And I've been trying to deal with this problem for several years now, because I think that the ways that majority people learn languages and the way that polyglots learn languages could be combined. And I think that clearly the way that we polyglots learn languages that way seems to work, right? So I'm trying to apply these methods also to help other people achieve just that. I have a special name for a type of people who are struggling to learn a foreign language and cannot succeed even with one language. I call them the timekeepers. A timekeeper is a person whom you ask, do you speak German? And they will reply, oh, well, I've had eight years of German at school, you know, or they tell you, I've been going to um, a course in French or whatever language for four years. And they always tell you the time. Have you noticed that? But they hardly ever speak the language. So I call them the timekeepers. You know, they always count the time that they've spent learning the language, but they don't have many results to show for that. And on the other hand, we have the polyglots. People just like you, these are the name tags from last polyglot gathering, who managed to speak several foreign languages fluently. Now the question is, how is that possible? How is it possible that there is these two groups of people that seem to be so different with such different results when it comes to their language learning? And this is exactly the question that I've been asking myself and trying to find the solution for that. First, before I start, I'll quickly introduce myself. First of all, I'm a passionate language learner. I really, really enjoy learning languages. Um, I learn usually a new language every two years. This is the system that I've had so far and um, I like to practice them anytime I can, for example, at the Polyglot Gathering. I also happen to be a professional conference interpreter, and maybe some of you saw the talk at the Polyglot Gathering 2015, where I talked about uh, the pleasures and pains of working as a conference interpreter, where I try to explain what this profession is really about. And I have a new profession. I'm a language mentor, and this is something that I made up uh, because I realized that I want to help people learn languages, but I don't want to teach them. And this is my approach to teaching people languages. I mentor them so that they can learn languages just like polyglots do using the same techniques and strategies. And finally, I happen to also organize the polyglot gathering this year. So you might know me in this role as well. Now, I will start my presentation with uh, showing you a few examples of how some polyglots learn languages. I've picked a few. Uh, that, I, that I'm sure you will probably know of, and I will briefly introduce their strategies to learn the languages so that we can see what is it actually, how do polyglots approach language learning and what methods do they use. So the first person I will introduce probably does not need any introduction at all. I'm sure we all know Benny Lewis from Fluent in Three Months. Well, Benny has a very interesting method, an interesting way to learn languages. It's called Speak from Day One. So Benny goes out there, doesn't speak the language at all, he just collects a few words, phrases, goes among the people in the country where the language is spoken, and starts speaking with them and learning from what, the, what he receives as a return. And so he collects you know, more and more vocabulary and practices and practices, makes a million mistakes a day, and this is his approach of learning languages. And I'm sure, well, this is the languages that uh, he's learned so far. It may be not totally updated. Maybe there are a few more missing ones, but this is just to show, you know, what can be achieved with such a method. I'm sure you all know Steve Kaufman, who is here with us as well at this gathering, uh, who has a slightly different approach. So he doesn't go for speaking right away, but instead he gets a lot of input first. So he listens and reads massively before speaking, before producing uh, speech. And in this way, he's been able to learn a bunch of languages himself. I think this is also not the complete list right now. And actually, I had a Skype lesson with Steve before the gathering where he was learning Slovak. And I was really impressed in his Slovak skills after just one week of, of learning. 
up and he told me that he's learned, he's listened and read a lot of Slovak stories and clearly it works really amazingly. Then I know, don't know if you know Lukas Bigetti, but he's also here with us at this gathering. And um, Lukas has quite an interesting method himself. I saw him at the last polyglot gathering with all these languages on his name tag and I, I practiced a few of them with him. And I was really impressed at the level that he was able to use those languages. And I looked at them and I said, Lucas, um, you have all these languages there, but I see no Esperanto. Have you ever thought about that? He was like, oh, not really, I don't know. I said, you know what, let's make a challenge. I'll, I'll help you learn Esperanto, and I think it will take you maybe three days or so. It actually took him an hour. <laughs> in that one hour, I explained the 16 grammar rules that Esperanto has and that you need to know in order to really know this language. So after an hour, we were speaking Esperanto, and I said, gosh, this is too easy, you know? So I, could, I said, okay, challenge number two, I'll help, help you learn Slovak. Aha. Uh -huh. And of course, this would be easier for Lukas than for many other people because he already spoke three Slavic languages very, very well, Russian, Polish, and Ukrainian. And uh, it took us about a day before we did a, a recording on video about how we speak Slovak. It was just amazing. Whenever I show this to Slovaks, uh, the, the conversation after one day, they just cannot believe it. They say, is this impossible? No one can learn our language in just one day, you know? And Lukas seems to have a method for that. It's a method that he developed together with Jan van der A, whom you might know as well, um, and they call it language boost, and it's about um, 500 most frequent words in a vocabulary uh, in a language that they learn with example sentences, and then using these sentences and these words, they can express many, many things in very simple terms, and they can communicate with just these 500 words. And then, of course, they continue uh, learning different vocabulary. So this is Lucas's approach. Then I don't know if you've heard about Gabriel Weiner. And Gabriel has an interesting method based on flashcards, based on space repetition system. And what is interesting is that he doesn't use translation at all. So he uses pictures of things that he can take a picture of, or he uses um, closed tests, so a word missing in a sentence when he wants to practice grammar. And in this way, Gabriel managed to learn a lot of languages himself, and he has a very interesting story about how he actually came up with this method. But we don't have time for that today, unfortunately. So this is the flashcard system with no translation. And then we have Luca Lampariello, who bases his learning mostly on translation. And this is interesting because Luca doesn't use flashcards at all. He's not a flashcard friend, a uh, flashcard user. And yet, it works amazingly for him. He's learned a bunch of languages to a very high and impressive level. I think we all know that. And uh, his method seems to be working just as well. And then I would like to introduce two more people to you. Robin McPherson. I don't know if you, if you met this guy. Um, he was told several times by his parents, teachers, friends, when he was young, that he doesn't have a talent for languages. He's just not good at languages and he probably should dedicate his life to something else because languages don't seem to be the thing for him. Well, he proved them wrong later on because today he speaks a bunch of languages really well on a very fluent level. And uh, he does this by using a special method which I personally call the dissection, dissection method. I don't know what he uses it particularly, but he basically takes a recording on, the, on YouTube, for example, a short video with subtitles in two languages, and um, he dissects it to very little parts, um, chunks of phrases that he puts into Memrise, and he keeps learning them over and over and over again, and this way he manages to uh, speak the language very well after a very short time. So this is Robin's method. And finally, I'd like to introduce David James, who I'm sure many of you know, Uncle Davey, who's not here with us at this gathering, unfortunately, but you know him probably from the previous ones. And David's method is called the Goldless method. Have you heard about that? If you haven't, check it out because it's really cool. I love it and I've been using it for several years and it works amazingly. You basically just write lists of vocabulary and you rewrite them every two weeks or more in order to distill the vocabulary that you have in your long-term memory and keep rewriting the vocabulary that you still don't. 
And this is really a fascinating process which works because every time you rewrite a list, you find out that your brain has remembered 30% of the vocabulary and you have it in the long-term memory. It's just, it's just an incredible method, very simple, very easy to use, and very effective. Now we could continue, well this is James, uh, David's, uh, David's languages that he's learned, and we could continue of course with many, many other polyglots, many of them are here with us today. I took just a few random pictures from the last gatherings, and I could have a presentation about every single one of you and describe the methods that you use, and it would be very different, right? Because everybody has their own system to learning languages, and all these systems seem to work clearly, because all of you have several um, several flags on the name tags, the languages that we can speak. So, what I'm trying to say with this is that every polyglot has their own way. And the question is, what, is, what, is, what do these polyglots have in common, right? And I'm going to discuss this in the second part. But firstly, I'll just briefly explain my own method. Uh, I'm sorry, the discussion will be right after the talk, okay? We'll, we'll discuss afterwards. So just to briefly explain my methods, I uh, start with the bidirectional translation method or the back translation method as I call it. Um, so I translate whole text from my mother tongue into the foreign language uh, so that I can use the phrases and, and learn them in context. It's very similar to Luca Lamparillo's method. And afterwards, I have um, four pillars of learning a language and I always keep these four pillars and it's helped me to learn all the languages that I speak today. First of all, I make sure that my language learning is fun. If it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, it's not a method for me. So that's why I work with materials that I pick myself. Um, I like them, I'm interested in reading the text and listening to the, to the uh, recordings, etc. And I do it in a way which is fun for me. So for example, the gold list method it is fun for me. Flashcards, me personally, not so much, so I prefer that method. Secondly, I do a lot of that. So I do a lot of learning. For example, when I watch something, I make sure I go for a TV series because it has a lot of episodes. And in this way, I get to see an episode every single day. And this gives me massive input that I can use in order to improve my listening comprehension. This way, I have seen all of the episodes of Sex and the City, Desperate Housewives, Friends, Lost, you name it, in several languages. And this is what I do in order to really understand the languages well. Thirdly, I decide to work with the language frequently in small chunks. So I learn, for example, half an hour or maybe an hour every day, but rarely more, because I think it's really more effective to learn in small parts, but frequently, really every day for some periods of time. And finally, I have a system in the language learning, which means that I always pick priorities that I have for a certain period of time, let's say two or three months, and I work on them a lot, I concentrate on them. So I never develop all the four skills at the same time, writing, reading, listening, and speaking. I always concentrate on what is the most important one for me at that period, and I work on that. Plus, I have a system when I do the things that I do. So for example, when I wake up, one of the first things I do is I distill some vocabulary in the gold list method, do some grammar exercises, etc., cetera, et cetera. And these are the languages that I've applied these methods to, and all besides the Slovak sign language that is at the bottom, I'm able to use more or less fluently today, and this is exactly the goal that I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I may be a little bit different from many of you in the way that I don't dabble in languages, so I don't learn the basics of several languages, because I decide to either go for it or not. You know, I don't want to spend a lot of time learning the basics of a language, because I feel that if I don't cross a threshold where I use the language fluently, then I will probably lose all of that time that I spent with the language. And this is why I prefer to really go all the way until I feel comfortable in the language, I can read books in it, I can listen to whatever I want and speak to the people. So now let's get to the main question of this presentation. What do these polyglots do differently? What do they have in common? And what is different in their language learning from the way that languages are learned by the majority language learners? by the majority of people who are struggling to learn even a single foreign language. And I have 10 things for you, because 10 is a nice number, right? So we'll start with the first one. And I would like to clarify that polyglots do not have a special talent for languages. And I think you will all agree with me, because this is not a gathering of super talented people who happen to be very lucky to have been born that way, right? 
This is about the approach that we take to language learning. And I have a proof for you to show that we are not super talented. Because all these people that I've mentioned before, who speak a lot of languages today, were not able to speak a foreign language until they were adults. Now I'm thinking, if these people had the super talent, wouldn't they have been the best students in class when they had some lessons of English or whatever language they were learning at school? I suppose they would. If the talent was there, it probably would have shown earlier, right? Not at the age of 21, 23, when they started to learn a foreign language. For example, Lucas is from Brazil. He did, he's had several years of English at school, but when he was 17 or 18, he could not speak at all. He's had several years of English at school, just like the timekeepers, right? But couldn't use the language. How's that possible? Such a talented language learner, such a talented polyglot. So I believe this really proves the fact that it's not about the special talent, it's about something else. I have a nice quote by Henry Ford who says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So I personally decide to believe that I have the language talent and it works for me. And so many people out there just tell you, oh, you speak so many languages, it's so easy for you, but you know me, I just don't have the language gene don't have the talent, so I'm not even trying, it doesn't make any, any sense. Well, they will not speak the foreign language because they decided that they don't have the talent. Secondly, I think that every polyglot has their own special method, which I think I've demonstrated in the first part of the presentation, and there is not one good method that people need to pick or adopt or uh, repeat by other people. You need to develop it yourself, right? And that's what I said about all of you. Every one of you has learned the languages in a different way. And probably, hope you agree with me, we even learn each language in a different way, right? So we sometimes uh, go for more listening, sometimes go for more speaking, sometimes reading, etc. Thirdly, polyglots learn languages mostly by themselves. And I believe this may be the key difference in the way that polyglots are learned out there in schools and language schools and the way that polyglots learn languages. And this is because the people, the majority of people learning a language, when they want to learn a language, what do they do? They find a language school or a teacher, they pay them and expect to be spoon-fed, right? Because they pay the teacher so that the teacher teaches them. And the only thing they are willing to do is to come to the lesson and wait to be taught. And I believe this is the whole thing, this is the whole problem with unsuccessful language learners, because if they did not approach language learning like that, if they were willing to actually give it the effort and the energy that all of us are giving it, then they would have very different results. Luca Lampariello put it very nicely when he said that languages cannot be taught, they can only be learned. And I totally agree with that, because it's just the way it is. And all of us have not been simply taught the languages by very skilled teachers, but we have learned them ourselves. We may have teachers, we may go to courses, we may go to conversation classes, etc. There's nothing bad with that, but it shouldn't be the main thing, the main time we spend with the language, right? Fourthly, polyglots create their own language material. I think we all agree to that. We don't have all just one book that we follow when we learn Spanish. We don't have just one book when we learn Portuguese. Instead, we create the materials that we want to use. So we create our own flashcards, our own collection of books, of texts, of recordings, YouTube videos, etc. Well, sometimes we go a little bit over the top and we collect a bit more books than we are able to use in the language learning, right? You all recognize this. Your little piles of books for all the languages you want to learn, I know. But I think this is still the good approach, even if we overdo it sometimes a little bit. The fifth point is that polyglots learn one language at a time. Now, some of you may disagree with me, and I will be happy to discuss it in the discussion, but my personal opinion is that this is the best way how it works. A question for you. How can you learn to speak 10 languages in two simple steps? And I know you, many of you know the answers because it was mentioned at the first polyglot conference in Budapest by Anthony Lauder, who said, Step one, you speak nine languages. Step two, you add one. Simple, right? Now, the logical question, what happens when you want to speak, learn to speak seven languages? You speak six and you add one. 
What happens when you want to speak five languages? You speak four and you add one. And if you want to speak two languages, you speak one, add one. Makes sense, right? So this is my reply to people asking me how can I learn two, three, five languages at the same time. I tell them, don't. <laughs> learn them one by one. Doesn't mean you, you cannot do anything with the other languages while you're learning one, but I think you should concentrate on one language. And I personally always spend at least 80% of my time with one language, and then I spend maybe 20% with the other ones to you know, keep them up, etc. The sixth point is polyglots spend much more time listening and speaking than the majority of learners. And I believe these two things are the, also the key to learning a language well and to having the different results. Because most people just go for reading, learning vocabulary, grammar, but nicely in their comfort zone. But they don't want to speak because they're not ready yet. Right? They will speak when they will feel ready. And I believe that listening is probably the most neglected skill that is used in the traditional lang school language learning system. I don't know about you, but when I was learning English um, here in Slovakia, <coughs> we would have a teacher come with a tape recorder once a week and play one recording of English. And we would do the exercises, listen to it again. That was all the listening I ever got in the lessons. And no one told me at that time that I need to listen to much, much more of language material in order to understand English well. Only later did I find that out, and now I apply it in all the languages that I learn. I just listen, listen, listen to podcasts, to YouTube videos, to TV series, anything I can, because otherwise I would not be able to understand the language. It just doesn't go without that. And I think this is something that teachers often forget to mention to their students. And secondly, I believe that there is no better activity to help us improve in the language actively than speaking. I believe that speaking is the key to actually having different results because once you start speaking, you see the improvement that you've had and it motivates you to learn more and get more vocabulary, etc. You activate all the knowledge you have and that's why I believe this is the number one skill that we should concentrate on, which is often neglected in the traditional school learning system. There is a moment in the language learning which I totally adore and that's the moment when I feel free in the language. You know what I'm talking about? When you suddenly understand the language, it doesn't cost you that much energy and it kind of feels your own. I had it last with Russian, um, this is the language that I'm learning right now. When I went to Russia after one year of learning and uh, I, I heard people speaking Russian in the street and I was like, oh, there's Slovaks out there. And after a few seconds, like, wait, this is Russian. I just happened to understand it so well, it feels like Slovak or it feels like Polish, which was my other uh, language, which I had at a, at, a, at a good level. So I really, really love this moment, and it feels like it's totally worth spending one or two years learning the language in order to achieve this level and just feel okay and free in the language. Point number seven is polyglots are not afraid to make mistakes. Now, how does an average language learner feel when they're supposed to say a sentence in a foreign language? and they might make a mistake. Something like that? I think everybody knows that feeling, right? Oh my God, I'm going to say a sentence in the foreign language. What if I make a mistake? Ooh, tragedy. And I think polyglots approach it differently. They go out there and they make many, many, many mistakes because that's the only way to learn, right? And I feel that we're just at ease speaking the language and using it with many mistakes. Actually, this is, this is something that one of my students told me, because uh, some of you have been learning Slovak before coming to the gathering, and one of them is Mikhail Mishkot, and he had a lesson with one of my students when they were practicing Slovak, and the student said after this lesson, well, this was amazing. I just saw how Mikhail was just so relaxed about the speak speaking the language. He was not worried about making a mistake, just took it easy, enjoyed the process, and he was at ease. And he said, it was so inspirational for me to see that because I'm always so stressed when I speak English. And I saw that it can be fun and okay and relaxed. And I think this is what we all have in common, don't we? When I had the lesson of Slovak with Steve Kaufman or with Richard Simkud, who have bon both been learning some Slovak, I saw how okay they were with making mistakes. They don't, they don't worry about that. And that's exactly what it takes in order to improve in your speaking skills. Point number eight is that polyglots 
have mastered the art of simplification. I think this is the key to speaking at the beginning when you don't really have the vocabulary, you don't have so many words. Now, I have an example to illustrate how I simplify things. When I was learning Spanish, I was just at the beginning, maybe A1, A, A2 probably. And I was out with some friends, uh, Spanish-speaking friends, Erasmus students here in Bratislava, and we were doing some shopping, etc. And afterwards, uh, they said they were hungry. So they asked me, is there any restaurants out there? And I was trying to explain to them in Spanish, my very, very limited Spanish, that yeah, there is a shopping center nearby and there is a food court that we can all go to and we can pick several types of restaurants, several types of cuisines, you know, and have a good meal. But with my very limited Spanish, all I said was, in esa casa hay mucha comida. <laughs> There's a lot of food in that house. And it worked, you know? I didn't, I didn't have to say much more. They all laughed, of course. We all laughed together. But I was not worried about making that mistake and they got the answer they wanted. So that's the art of simplification, isn't it? And if we apply this to any, any speaking lesson, then we can really improve quickly. This is what Lucas does with his 500 words, the most frequent words in the vocabulary, just simplifies all ideas that he wants to express. So if you get good at this skill, you're good to speak any language even from day one. Ninth point is that polyglots learn in small chunks. And I would like to debust the myth that polyglots spend ages learning languages and they don't do anything else all day long. Well, there are days like that when we are really eager about the language, right? But not, usually not. I don't know about you, but I have a life, actually. I don't spend hours learning a language a day. That would be boring. So I spend maybe an hour, an hour and a half tops. But I do it every day. I do it regularly, do it in small chunks, and that way I know that the progress will come. And it does, and it feels very good. We all know that learning a language is a, is a marathon, not a sprint. So if we try to rush it, it won't work. But if you enjoy the process, step by step, much better, much more effective. And finally, the final point that I want to make is that polyglots really enjoy learning languages. And now I know that many people will think, oh, okay, well, that's the thing. Language learning is not my hobby. That means that I will not be a polyglot, I will not speak any foreign language well, because I just, you know, I have other hobbies, but not language learning. But I think this is wrong. The question is not whether you happen to have language learning as a hobby, but the question is how can you make language learning a hobby if you need to learn the language? And I think there are so many ways, so many beautiful ways how to do this, because you can, for example, watch your favorite series, right? I always tell people, watch Friends with English subtitles or no subtitles at all in English. I tell these people in Slovakia who are mostly learning Slovak, and they always go like, oh, well, actually, I could do that. I enjoy friends, you know, but they said, what if I don't understand? I said, don't worry about it. You will later on. Just give it the time. You need to give it a lot of input. It will improve, trust me. And then they come to me after a month or two and say, oh, I understand so much of friends already. This is cool. This is because they enjoy this process of watching series. You can also read many interesting articles, for example, about healthy lifestyle, if that's what interests you. I tell people, don't go for the text in the textbooks. Instead, find blogs about the topics that you care about. And in this way, the learning will be just fun and you will enjoy it. It will be great. You can listen to podcasts about traveling, for example. If you're passionate about traveling, it doesn't need to be a podcast uh, you know, that is meant for language learners. Just try to go for native material. Give it a lot of time and input it will work. You can read books about personal development. I think that reading nonfiction in a foreign language is so much easier than reading fiction. Many people go for these old, old books from the 18th, 19th century, which I think are pretty difficult to learn if you're starting with a language. But go for Brian Tracy or something like that, you know, personal development where someone is using the current language to express ideas, to tell them to you, to give you advice. It will work perfectly. Or, for example, you can learn grammar through an app. It doesn't need to be a book. I have a good example of a student of mine, Eric Hoffman, who is uh, pretty well known as a, as a marketing specialist in Slovakia, who had a huge problem learning English. He said he was learning it for 20 years as an eternal beginner. He couldn't cross the fluency level. He couldn't have a conversation with me. But afterwards, he said, I've improved my English more in half a year than in 20 years of being an eternal beginner. How's that possible? Well, one of the keys for him 
was to learn grammar through an app. I told him, he, he said, I really need to improve my English grammar, but I don't like books. So I told him, okay, there is an app, you know, uh, Murphy's English Grammar News, you know the book? I think the best uh, English grammar there is. It's an app now. You can download it and, you know, do the exercises in the app, and you don't have to go through a book and check the key, etc. And this, for him, was a revolutionary thing. He was addicted to learning Ang English for several months and really improved amazingly. I would like to quote Steve on this one, who said, success in language learning depends on you finding ways to enjoy the process. And I totally subscribe to that. So these are the 10 things that I believe are the key to learning languages successfully, learning them the way that polyglots do. And I believe that if anyone out there, whether they're talented or not, copy these strategies, they find their own way and just apply these techniques, they will definitely have to succeed. And Tony Robbins said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Makes sense, right? And yet, the people out there still keep trying the, the same things all over again for many years. They've been learning English at language schools and just language schools, no learning at home, for many, many years. And they think that if they change the language school, it will work. But I, I think the system is just not set correctly. You need to change your approach to language learning, and that's when you can actually achieve a great, great change in the results that you have with the language learning. The question now is, so what do we do about this? There is a huge gap between the way polyglots learn languages and the way they're taught in schools and language schools. What do we do about that? So this is the question I've been dealing with for a long time, and my answer to this question is language mentoring. That is my approach to learning languages. And you may remember some of you last year at the gathering, I had a talk about language mentoring, don't teach me, make me learn. Uh, where I explained to you that I had a, an experiment with 100 students at a Comenius University in Bratislava. And uh, I told them, don't expect this university to teach you, go for it and learn yourselves. And a miracle happened, a revolution in the learning, seriously, because they started learning and their results were just amazing. I then continued, after the last gathering that we had in Berlin, I continued and started to teach this to people in Slovakia. I've done a lot of seminars. I'm trying to spread the message uh, by giving talks uh, all over Slovakia and telling people that polyglots are not the super talented people. You can all learn the languages yourselves. And it's really, really fascinating to see what a change this makes in many, many people's lives. And they write me often emails. Actually, I quote them. They say, you've changed my life because now I can, I've, I've learned this language and I can use it to go work abroad, you know, to, to communicate with so many people out there, etc., etc. And just last week, I received a really beautiful email from a guy that attended one of my talks in Žilina, a city in Slovakia, uh, who said that <coughs> I've been trying to learn English for such a long time and it just never, never worked. And then I went to your talk and I heard you say that I don't need a talent to do that. That he actually quoted the, the quote by Henry Ford, what do you think you can or you can't, you're right. And he said, this totally changed my life. Now I'm learning English two or three hours a day, and I started going to interviews in Bratislava looking for a job, and I just enjoy it, you know, I speak and speak, and before I was just stuttering, I was not sure of myself, and now suddenly it works, and it's amazing, so thank you for that, for, for sharing this polyglot message with us. So I would like to end this presentation with a quote, which all of you have received as a, as a bookmark, so you have it as a little souvenir. The best time to start learning a language was when you were a kid, the second best time is today. So I hope that this, this inspires you to keep on learning your languages, even though sometimes it's a lot of hard work, it's not always fun, but I hope it helps you keep uh, motivated and inspired. If you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is whether in this half an hour to one hour a day that I recommend, there is also the other contact with the language. I think that this one hour of contact a day is enough, whereas most part of that should be active learning, where you actually sit down and concentrate on that. But I usually spend 20 to 30 minutes a day just listening to podcasts, for example, when I walk, when I do something else. Um, 
usually what happens is that I, I fall in love with uh, something that I use, like uh, material, for example, right now I'm watching Kuchnia to learn Russian, amazing series, very recommended. And I, so I make a plan, so, okay, I will watch an episode every day, but then the episode is so good that I actually watch another one. So it often happens to me that I spend more time with the language, but it's not planned, it's not part of the, the system, but I just enjoy it that way. Thank you, yes? How can I imply this uh, methodology of teaching this way on a more structural level? Yes, I'm working on that. I've just been spending a year with that, so give me some more time. Now, actually, this can be applied massively to a lot of people. Right now, in my courses, I have a in my current course, I have 120 people learning very different languages all at the same time. And I, this is the language mentoring group that I have. It's all online. They don't even need to be in one place. And they're all improving, all in, with, their, with their own plan, with their own system. And it seems to be working well. So I'm trying to find ways how to spread this even more and get more people into this, but it seems to be working massively pretty well. Thank you. Let's try in the back. So the question is, what, is the, what has been the resistance so far to the methods that I'm trying to spread? Hmm? Well, of course, this is, this is not a method for everyone, as everything. People, you know, there, there will be haters and, and people who oppose, and I'm okay with that because I'm not trying to make everyone learn this way. What I'm trying to spread is that if there are so many people out there, polyglots like all of us, who manage to learn languages, then there must be something about their learning, and it's worth looking uh, to those methods uh, in, in more detail. But so far, I haven't, I haven't experienced anyone like fighting against this, because clearly there's results. So if someone sh shows me a different approach, which works much better, then I'm open to discuss that, of course. But I'm not saying that the, you know, languages should be learned this way. All I'm saying is you should spend more time with the language, make it fun, make it frequent, and have a system in that. And I think no one really opposes this or says that, oh, well, this doesn't work. You know, People like to add different things that are the most important things, and I'm very open to revising that. But other than that, I, I don't think uh, people are against that idea in general. Yes? That's a great idea. So that's a call for action. Let's spread these ideas in other contexts, not just in Slovakia. I totally agree. And, but I actually don't think that the context is so different for Slovak learners than it is for New Zealanders. I know that for you, it's not so easy to go to another country and practice the language, of course. But uh, what people that I'm working with mostly are people who cannot really go to a different country. They have a family here, you know, their work, etc. Maybe they can go for a week-long holiday, but that's not enough. But I think especially with the internet, you don't really need to do go to another country in order to learn the language. So with the internet, we can be anywhere, you know, just using online teachers, for example, to practice, etc. And in that case, um, I think that it's actually very similar. But yes, I agree with you, and please share the message on in New Zealand and anywhere else. Thank you for that. I'm sorry, I'm afraid we'll have to end now. One more minute, okay? One, one more question. Uh, I saw that here, yes. I'm sorry, which weapon? Uh, what do you think of total physical response method for kids as a starter and you, do you think we can uh, make this for, uh, suitable for adults? I don't know the details of this method, unfortunately, so I cannot tell you much more about that. But I think that any method can be applied within the system. Like, this is not a particular method. But actually, whether you apply flashcards, whether you apply, uh, you know, the di direct uh, conversational method or anything else, it, it can work if you do a lot of it and you do it frequently. That would be my answer. Okay, thank you all very much for coming and enjoy the rest of the <laughs> gathering.